back with another short video in which together with the recent admission of variant readings in Quranic manuscripts, I hope will help Muslims realize that the Quran is not unique nor does it have a divine origin. I first want to point out that many stories told by Muhammad are not stories that were divine or sent down by Allah, but rather uninspired heretical teachings and fables he simply received hearsay and then gave an Islamic twist and claimed it was from Allah. Unfortunately for Muslims, we do know where these stories come from. They come from Gnostic writings and Jewish fables that predate the Quran. Let's go over some uninspired sources that predate the Quran in which Muhammad brought from. In Surah 19, we read the story of Mary in the palm tree, that is, Mary who was pregnant with Jesus, traveling to a far place to give birth, ends up resting under a palm tree. Allah tells her to shake the trunk of a tree in order to cause the dates to fall, which she did, and was replenished. However, this story predates the Quran and comes from the uninspired Gnostic writing of Pseudo-Matthew chapter 20. So, was this story inspired by and sent down by Allah? So we are back with our uh, Shi uh, male uh, friend, which is uh, Sahih Luke the Christian. And so before I have to address this, that he's using some sources from the Bible. Now I want to confirm something. There are things in the Bible that are st still exist today that are revealed from Allah. And there are things that are not revealed uh, by Allah. So as for us Muslims, we don't know them. And none of, none of the people know which is the corrupt one, which is the one revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we keep quiet on this uh, thing, as the hadith says. So as we, as we see in this hadith, in Sahih al-Bukhari, narrated by Abu Huraira, that the people of the book used to read the Torah in Hebrew and then explain it in Arabic to the Muslims. Allah's Messenger وسلم, said to the Muslims, Do not believe the people of the book, nor disbelieve them, but say we believe in Allah and whatever is revealed to us and whatever is revealed to you. So the revealed parts of the Bible and the Torah that are revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that still exist in them, we believe that we believe in them that they are true but the corrupt ones we don't believe in them the ones are have been corrupted by human hands as for comparing for example saying that the quran has been stolen uh, from sources or from pagan sources or from uh, christian jews uh, sources this does not make sense because i can argue the same thing about christianity that the term son of god was stolen from the ancient egyptians the ancient egyptians gods and goddesses used to call themselves uh, used to call their sons the son of of God, for example, this this God, or for Os Os Osiris, for example, Osiris was, you know, he died and he was also resurrected from the dead, uh, which is clearly shows that where Jesus' methodology is, is uh, uh, stolen from. Also, we have um, a man named uh, Orpheus. Orpheus, like he was, um, uh, you know, the Christians, how they created the tradition of Jesus being uh, dead for three days and then raising resurrection. Uh, is similar to that because uh, Orpheus, Orpheus was a, a pagan god who was also crucified and was resurrected from the dead as well. And as you can see, this is his uh, picture right here. Uh, also, we can argue that the uh, cross symbol was also taken from the ancient Egyptians, uh, pagans, and was also taken from pagan uh, so-called so you know, uh, people who used to wear it or gods that used to wear it. As a necklace so even if we see uh, Tertullian confesses that pagans worship crucified saviors hang on a cross crosses moreover we Christians neither venerate nor wish for you indeed who uh, consecrate gods of wood venerate wooden crosses perhaps as parts of your gods for your very standards as well as your banners and flags of your camps what are uh, they but crosses gilded and adorned your victorious trophies not only imitate the appearance of a simple cross but also that of a man affixed to it there's also the pagan roots of christianity are clearly indicated by this confession uh, Tur uh tertullian was a christian who later became agnostic he implies that christians borrowed the sun god myth and this is pretty clear uh, this source is from willingson's egyptians sir john gardner willingson uh, 1837 to 41. The pagan philosophies and satires, uh, Celsus criticized Christians for trying to pass off the Jesus story as a new revelation when it was actually an inferior imitation of pagan myths. He asks, are they, are these distinctives happening unique to Christians? And if so, how are they unique? Or are ours to be accounted myths and their beliefs? What reasons do the Christians give for their distinctive distinctiveness of their beliefs? In truth, there is nothing at all unusual about the Christians about what Christians believe, except that they believe to um, believe it to the 
exhaustion of more comprehensive truths about God. The early Christians were painfully aware of such criticism. How could pagan myths which uh, predate Christianity be hundreds of years have uh, by hundreds of years have so much in common with the biographies of the one and only Savior Jesus? Desperate to come up with the explanation, the church fathers resorted to, the, to one of the most absurd theories ever advanced. From the time of Justin Merter in the 2nd century onward, they declared that the devil had plagiarized Christianity by anticipation in order to lead people astray. Knowing that the true Son of God was literally to come and walk the earth, the devil had copied the story of his life in advance of it happening and created myths of Osiris uh, Dionysus. The church father Tertullian uh, writes to the devil to the devil's uh, uh, diabolically mimicry in creating the mysteries of Mirtha, uh, Mithras. Sorry, Mithras. The devil, those whose business is to prevent the truth, mimics the exact circumstances of the divine scarcement. He, bapt he baptizes his believers and promises forgiveness of sins for the sacred found and thereby imitates them into the religion of Mithras. Thus he celebrated the obligation of breed and brings in the symbols of the resurrection. Let us therefore acknowledge the craftiness of the devil who copies certain things to those that be divine. So these are studying the myths of mysteries. It becomes obvious why these uh, uh, Christians resorted to such a desperate explanation. This is the source is the Jesus mysteries uh, page 26 to 27. Now I want to make something clear. If uh, Christianity did not steal from anyone, why for example, we see for example the Hindu gods as also as looking as men, uh, so uh, looking as humans as well and that Hindus worship them in, in similar to the Trini uh, Trinity for example. Why in other words we uh, see that um, you know uh, this, the cross symbol is the, the symbol of the ancient Egyptians as well. This is all, you know, this is all, these symbols are all uh, proof that Christianity is nothing but stolen from paganism. So if we try to say that uh, the term son of God uh, already existed at the ancient Egyptian's time and the Christians stole it, this is much more clear that they didn't actually steal it. And from other words, we understand that, uh, you know, that the symbol of the cross is stolen from ancient Egyptian uh, cross necklaces that the gods and goddesses used to wear as well. Also, human sacrifices was uh, very popular within pagan religions. For example, we have one story, uh, a historical story of Abdul Muttalib and the father and his son Abdullah, which is the father of Prophet Muhammad During the pagan times before Prophet Muhammad uh, was born, uh, Abdul Muttalib, he, he said, I swear that if Allah gives me 10 sons, that I will sacrifice one of, one of my sons by the Kaaba. This is what he said, and uh, this and and usually the the these when they they, they draw lots, the lot came that uh, three times that Abdullah, the father of Prophet Muhammad was to be sacrificed. So we can see that human sacrifice was even popular in the Jahiliya periods, in the pre-Islamic periods, within pe pagan religions, similar as Jesus as human sacrifices that to purify the sins of people. This is the belief that Christians have. Also, we know there is a god also called uh, Tammuz, the, the Babylonian god Tammuz also died and was resurrected as well. And, um, you know, uh, Tammuz was uh, crucified as an atonement offering, right? Trust ye in God, for out of his loins salvation has come unto us. Julius uh, Firmico speaks of this god rising from the dead for the salvation of the world. This savior, which long preceded the advent of Christ, filled the same role in sacred history. Uh, so, similarly as the Muse, we can see that. So, the doctrine of salvation by crucifixion had, like many of the ancient forms of religious faith, an astronomical origin. The sun is hanged on a cross or crucified when it passes through the equinox, right? Equinoxes. People in the north climates were saved by the sun's crucifixion when it crossed over the equilateral line into the season of spring. At the vernal equinox at Easter and thereby, thereby gave out a saving heat and light to the world, stimulated the generative organs of animals and vegetable life. The pagan festival is actually a combination of both Astroya, from which the word Easter is derived from, the female goddess of fertility, 
of the Northern European Saxons and Isis uh, Osiris cult. The lover of Astro Astroia Attis dies in reborn and is reborn annually in conjunction with the summer solstice, springtime, the time of the year of the Easter celebrations. The theology of Attis was incorporated into the events of Prophet Jesus, including the Christian uh, church that is the symbol of Astroia is the egg, which is part of the Easter celebration, Easter egg. In the Isis or Osiris cult of ancient Egypt, crucifixion was often a required means of sacrificing the king as the incarnation of God for salvation of men. Such bloody sacrifices were accompanied by the belief that the Savior's flesh and blood had to be eaten and drunk in a cannibalistic scarment. This is uh, uh, currently practiced by Catholic Church metaphorically in all their masses. Yet one cannot ignore the pagan roots of this act. The Catholic Church actually believes in the transubstantiation uh, of this ceremony instituted by St. Thomas Aquinas in the 12th century. Meaning the Catholics uh, believe that the bread and, and, the, and the, the bread and wine use, turn, uh, use turns into the actual flesh and blood of Jesus, exactly in line with the ceremony of the Isis Osiris cult, which dates back to 1700 BC. The notion of Jesus had to be sacrificed for the salvation of all mankind traces back to this older barbarism. Barbarism, right? So, scholar, the scholar Tom Harper states, the divine teacher is, call, uh, is called, is tested by the adversary, gathers uh, disciples, hears the sick, preaches the good news about God's kingdom, finally runs afoul of his bitter enemies, suffers, dies, and is resurrected after three days. This is a story. This is the total pattern of the Sun God in all ancient dramas. This is the pagan Christ, page 145. When the Council of Nicaea took place, the Emperor Constantine declared the Roman Sunday to be the Christian Sabbath, adopted the traditional birthday of the Sun God and the 25th of December as the birthday of Jesus, borrowed the emblem of the Sun God, the Cross of Light, to be an uh, emblem of Christianity. And although the statue of Jesus replaced the idol of the sun god, decided to incorporate all the ceremonies which were performed at the sub god's birthday celebrations into their own ceremonies. So here is all clear that it's all stolen from uh, Christian sources, and I can give you many more, but um, I think this is enough. And the last but definitely not least, Keith Thompson reminds us where Muhammad stole his story of dual Karnain from in Surah 18. Modern scholars have shown the Quranic story of this dual Karnain in Surah 18 actually comes from the pre-Islamic mythical Syriac source called A Christian Legend Concerning Alexander, translated into English by Sir Ernest Alfred Wallace Budge in 1889. When one compares the Quranic story in Surah 18 to the Syriac tale of Alexander the Great side by side, there is no question this is where the Quran got the Alexander fable. There are more than 11 similar features between the two stories, such as Alexander having two horns, being given power, the sun rising on the people with no cover, punishment of the unrighteous, Gog and Magog spoiling the land, and the building of a wall as a defense. As Stoneman notes, quote, The commentators on the Quran universally assume that dual Quranain here in Surah 18 is the name of Alexander. Their assumption was clearly correct, since the two stories here in Surah 18 associated with dual Karnain are precisely those two stories associated with Alexander in the Syriac legend of Alexander, current shortly before the composition of the Quran. This proves unequivocally the Quran is not of divine origin, but instead stole earlier uninspired mythical stories or legends. So if you thought the story was from Allah, okay. Now let's see if you are being honest with your viewers and if you will tell them from which version you are reading. Proskynesis was a Persian method of worship. Let me ask the Muslims watching this, does this look familiar? Except for the last stage of Persian proskynesis, with the entire body lying face down, it's pretty much exactly what Muslim prayers eventually became as well. You also forgot that number 4, 3 and 2 are not similar to the Muslim prayer. And what if a certain prayer before Prophet Muhammad is similar to the Muslim prayer? What is wrong with that? As Muslims, we believe that Allah sent a messenger to every nation. Like for example, the Persians have texts which clearly command them to worship God alone. Yet they corrupted these teachings and worshipped the fire. The Hindus also have clear texts which command them to worship God alone. Yet they corrupted these teachings and worshipped 300 million idols. 
Christians also have clear teachings to worship God alone. Even Prophet Jesus clearly said according to their own book to worship God alone. Yet they corrupted these teachings and to worship Jesus himself, even though his message was clear to worship God alone. Remember that next time you're in a mosque. You're simply seeing an ancient Persian ritual of worship. The picture you are seeing is not even a prayer. It is a Persian method of bowing down to kings. It's not even a prayer as he says. Not something new and unique to Islam. And who said to you that we Muslims believe that Prophet Muhammad invented a new religion? Who said to you that we believe that Prophet Muhammad brought something new? You don't even understand our belief to criticize it. We believe that Prophet Muhammad is the final prophet. He didn't bring something original or new. Even Allah says this. كل ما كنت بدعا من الرسل say I'm not something original among the messengers we also saw in an earlier video how the Quran appears to borrow the idea of the sun setting into a muddy spring from a pre-Islamic poem by Tubba Tubba even wrote a poem for praising Prophet Muhammad we also see this verse do you not see that Allah has made subservient to you whatsoever is in the earth and the ships running in the sea by his command? And he withholds the heaven from falling on the earth except with his permission. So as we can see from these Quranic verses, the sky is being held up above our heads. It would fall down onto us if it weren't for God keeping it up. is very similar to the story in the Quran. Is it just a pure coincidence? I mean, so far, both the Alexander myths and the Quran say a man known as the man with two horns traveled all over the world. Both say he saw the sun rising above a people who have no shelter from it. Both say he went to mountains to see a people who were complaining about Gog and Magog. Now the Quran says he used iron and brass to build the barrier to keep Gog and Magog out. So let's see what materials were used in the myth to keep Gog and Magog at bay. Alexander commanded and fetched 3,000 smiths, workers in iron, and 3,000 men, workers in brass. And they put down brass and iron, and needed it as a man needs when he works clay. Then they brought it and made a gate. Now, in the Quran, we also hear that Gog and Magog will break free from their incarceration towards the end of time and cause havoc on earth, an idea supported in the authentic hadiths. The verse says, until the Gog and Magog people are let through their barrier, and they swiftly swarm from every hill. Now the Alexander myth also tells us Gog and Magog will be released towards the end of time, and also take over the world. When the world shall come to an end by the command of God the ruler of creation, created things shall anger God, and sin shall increase, and wrath shall reign, and the sins of mankind shall mount up and shall cover the heavens, and the Lord will stir up in his anger the kingdoms that lie within this gate. For when the Lord seeks to slay man, he sends men against men, and they destroy one another. And the Lord will gather together the kings and their hosts which are within this mountain and they shall be assembled at his beck and shall come with their spears and swords and shall stand behind the gates and shall look up to the heavens and shall call upon the name of the Lord saying O Lord open to us this gate and the Lord shall send his sign from heaven and a voice shall call on this gate and it shall be destroyed and fall at the beck of the Lord what we just read also encapsulates this idea in an authentic hadith which tells us the barrier will be breached after they ask nicely to Allah okay so now what he is doing is that he is reading verses from Quran and comparing them with passages from Alexander Romans, claiming that Quran copied from Alexander Romans. But did he even tell his viewers from which version of Alexander Romans he is reading? The version which he is reading from is the Syriac version of Alexander Romans, which was written in the 7th century. This version which he is reading from was written in the 7th century after Quran. And here are the evidences from a book named Gog and Magog in Early Eastern Christian and Islamic Sources, page number 17, the Syriac tradition. It dates from the 7th century. The Syrian redactor, probably an Eastern Syrian Christian, added a certain number to the text. The episode of Alexander's building a wall against Gog and Magog, however, is not found in the oldest Greek, Latin, Armenian, and Syriac versions of the Romans. The barrier episode has not its origin in this text, which clearly means that the story of Gog and Magog in the book of Alexander Romans was added in the 7th century. Also from an article by Tubingen University, it is well known that Alexander appears in the Quran, Surah 18, under the name of Zulkarnain. This episode is not found in the oldest form of the Greek Alexander Romans. It was only interpolated to it. Interpolated. Interpolated means that it was added, added. In page 8 of the same source, the legend of Alexander's shutting in of Gog and Magog is also found in the Apocalypse of Pseudo Macedius, which is interpretation of the Arab conquest. Interpretation of the Arab conquest. This simply means that it was copied from Quran. This work also was composed in Syriac, sometime in the last quarter of the 7th century. 
This clearly means that the story of Gog and Magog in the book of Alexander Romans was written in the last quarter of the 7th century after the revelation of Quran. And the source clearly here says that it was interpretation of the Arab conquest. And who were the Arab conquerors? Muslims, of course. So as we can clearly see, that this guy is not being honest and should not be trusted. Obviously, an all-knowing God will not have made such historical mistakes as we have just seen. As we can see, the idiot again takes it out of context and calls the... Uh, Mary as the biological sister of Aaron. This is false because sometimes uh, th there's no mention in the Quran that Aaron's sister is Mary at all. Whenever it refers to his sister, it just says his sister without any name. So we have to understand here that O sister of Aaron means the nation, you know, she, the, the, uh, referring to her as sister, meaning in the Arabic language, sometimes sister can mean ya ukht, meaning the nation that was before. So she's from the ancestry of Aaron. And this is what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu says in the hadith as we're going to explain. You can see the Quran chapter 7 verse 38. It says, كُلَّمَا دَخَلَتْ أُمَّةٌ لَعَنَتْ أُخْتَهَا Whenever, every time a nation entered, it cursed its sister. Meaning its nation that was before it. So here it says, say he enter up among nations that already passed away even bef uh, before you of the jinn and man and humankind into the fire. Who, where Whenever a nation enters, it curses its sister nation. Actually in the Arabic verse it just says it curses its sister. But they put you here sister nation meaning refer referring specifically that in the Arabic language sister can be used for the previous nation. Until when they are all together have successively overtaken each other, the last one of them says to the first of them, our Lord, these let us let us into error. So bring them a double uh, torment of the fire. Say he to each a double, but you do not know. So exactly here, as you can see, it says it curses a sister nation that went before, that was before. So it's clearly, here it says, it means sister, only without nation, but uhtah. But it says, whenever a nation enters, it cursed its sister. Uhtaha, meaning the ones, the nation that was before it. And clearly we also see in the Quran, Sahih Muslim, uh, sorry, in the Hadith Sahih Muslim right here, Mughira bin Shu'ab reported, when I came to Najran, they, the Christians of Najran, asked me, you read, O sister of Aaron, or Harun, uh, in the Quran, whereas Moses was born much before Jesus. When I came back to Allah's Messenger, I asked him about that, whereupon he said, the people of the old age used to give names to their persons after the names of the apostles and pious persons who had gone before them. Now, here you can clearly see they put in brackets Maryam, which is wrong, because they probably, some of them did report error and edit it there. But in the Arabic version, you can see that nowhere it says, uh, nowhere it says that uh, it is the sister of Mar uh, Maryam. This they put it between brackets, meaning that some someone has edited. So we also see that sometimes the the brother or the sister does not have to be the biological brother or sister, or from the, it can be from your, your tribe. In the same tribe you are from, for example, the Prophet sometimes they are referred to the brother of this tribe. I Meaning they are not biological brothers from this tribe, but they belong to this uh, nation, for example, or this tribe. So here you can see, وَإِلَى ثَمُودَ أَخَاهُمْ صَالِحًا Right? And to Thamud, meaning the nation of Thamud, we sent their brother Salih. Meaning brother here does not mean bi biological brother, because the Quran refers to many of the prophets as bro brother, brother, brother. So, uh, so this means that they are from that tribe. He said, oh my people worship Allah, etc, etc. So if you keep going, afterwards you can even continue to see that, uh, uh, you know, many, many other prophets called, you know, uh, brothers or, you know, their their his brother or for example etc etc so uh, you know you can you can clearly see that uh, here for example in Quran chapter 11 verse 84 right and to the tribe of Madian or the nation of Madian we send their brother Shuaib does not mean biological brother but it means brother this is all the same thing also in the Bible and also prove that the problem emerges according to this Christian website in the original text of the gospel we find the good word Adelphos meaning brothers used. However, Adelphos does not mean blood brothers born of the same parents. Rather, Adelphos was used to describe brothers not born of the same parents like a half-brother or step-brother. The word also describes other relationships like cousins, nephews, uncles. As I said, the brother is also used to describe um, you know, relationships like cousins, nephews, etc. So, you know, you can see, for example, um, for example, in Genesis 13, 8 and 14, so uh, and 14 to chap uh, verse 14 to 16 the word Adelphos was used to describe the relationship between Abraham and Lot however these two men did not share a blood brother relationship but one of uncle and nephew right so it's exactly what it means